Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Three days ahead of Ontario's provincial election, two of the party leaders are vowing to end for-profit group homes and foster care agencies after a scathing investigation by Global News and APTN National News. Youth in Care said they were neglected, mistreated, and repeatedly physically restrained by workers without cause. Some experts suggest one of the reasons is the system is failing is because private for-profit operators may be putting money ahead of the best interests of kids. Carolyn Jarvis reports. The child welfare system shouldn't be a profit, uh, a profit to making endeavor. It just shouldn't. The leader of the Ontario NDP vowing to remove for-profit group home and foster care operators from the system if elected. The fact that kids are not getting enough food, that they're being restrained, that they're not getting the health care services that they need, while some company reaps the profits off of that, completely unacceptable. A Global News APTN investigation analyzed more than 10,000 serious occurrence reports from the child welfare system in Ontario from a one-year period and found an alarmingly high number of incidents at some foster care and group homes, including deaths, injuries, missing kids, and the use of restraints. And while private operators only make up 25% of beds in the system, they account for 55% of all serious occurrence reports in group homes and foster care homes, including 83% of all physical restraints. The for-profit sector should not exist. Advocates for young people in care say they've known for a long time how bad things really are. This has been a long-standing issue that we knew about on the ground. I grew up in the child welfare system myself, and this is it's about time that this is in the spotlight now. The leader of the Ontario Greens echoed the call to end for-profit group home and foster care, while the Ontario Liberals did not, saying oversight of the system needs to be reviewed. As far as I'm concerned, it's unacceptable. Ontario PC leader Doug Ford also sidestepped the issue of for-profit care, vowing instead to increase inspections and admitting the province needs to do better. And we're going to make sure, myself personally, I'm going to be on this, uh, right as we have been, but right after the election, that's going to be one of my key focuses. The Ontario government is in the middle of a multi-year child welfare redesign. But there is no indication that reform will eliminate for-profit care. Carolyn Jarvis for APTN National News. In Winnipeg, an Indigenous woman is the city's latest homicide. Police identified 31-year-old Tessa Perry as Winnipeg's latest homicide victim. Perry is the third First Nations woman to be murdered in Winnipeg in just the last three weeks. Last week, 25-year-old Doris Trout was the victim of a homicide. Police are still searching for two women who are persons of interest in that case. On May 16th, the partial remains of 24-year-old Rebecca Contois were discovered. A man is in custody in that case, and police have not ruled out the possibility of additional victims. A 29-year-old male has been charged with second-degree murder in the death of Perry. A vigil will be held for her tomorrow night. It's every parent's worst nightmare. Your child leaves for a night out and never comes home. 20-year-old Luc Jolie de Rocher from Kebouac First Nation in Quebec has been missing since 2011. As Lindsay Richardson tells it, 11 years later, Luke's family is trying to keep heat on the case that for years has risked running cold. I lived here for seven years. You don't want to be caught in some areas here at night. I remember a friend was downtown and there's a pizza joint not far from the bar and he took an alleyway to get back to his car and uh, they beat him up for his pizza. It's not a, a good place. I don't like this city anymore. For years, Rob Jolie's tried to avoid North Bay, but today he's here looking for something. He might have went this way. Let's go this way. We think. Or rather, looking for someone. Luke comes out the steps, stands there, looks around like this and heads west. That was the last time he was seen. The year was 2011. Rob's son, 20-year-old Luc Jolie de Rocher from Kebouac First Nation in Quebec, vanished after a night out with friends in Ontario. It's hard to explain. You know, we have, we have loved ones that's passed. We mourn, we grieve, but we learn to accept it. When you have a, a child that's missing and you, you, you don't know where he is, you don't know whether to cry or lose hope or mourn. It's, 
it, it's difficult. Luke had just rented his first apartment. He was expected at a family event the day after he went missing. So the family didn't buy early theories about Luke still partying or blowing off steam. To me, things weren't moving fast enough. They thought it was just a kid from Quebec that ran away and nobody really took it seriously that, you know, something, something more seriously happened there. So for over a decade now, Rob's kept track of every lead. When we first started getting in with the media, I made a scrapbook. Every headline. The search continues, March 21st. Every potential clue. Well, I print out a lot of stuff for the police. I email the police, but I'm just uh, constantly going at it. The North Bay Police Service has the lead on Luke's case. It's switched hands a few times, but the acting investigator insists the file is still very active. It's around the 600 tips that we've received from the public. Again, we've spoken to over 1,300 people, um, and that's from anywhere from North Bay to Timiskaming, Kip Kippewa, Toronto, um, uh, British Columbia. Hundreds and hundreds of statements have been taken, official statements that people went on the record. So Rob's revisited the night of Luke's disappearance on his own, over and over. We have some out there. There's a the cops. They're always watching this area because there's a couple of crack houses here, but we'll go out. And we'll uh, just take a walk around. This is what we know. On March 4th, 2011, Luke was staying at this house with friends. They headed to Cecil's bar, where Luke was turned away. In the camera, he fades away going that way. A bank From camera the down the street captures Luke being Cecil's followed into an ATM, but no yeah. money was withdrawn. So Luke's debit card was found in a snowbank a week later. His keys, wallet and jacket recovered untouched back at the Sherbrooke house. And uh, nobody even paid attention to where Luke was. And it seems like they just forgot about him that night. Even today, locals have theories. Well, I hear it was over a twenty dollar debt. It I could be uh, Chuck because that's all he had on him. At times, it feels like so people don't time. want Luke to be found. That was up there for a while. I use a step ladder to put them up so they don't tear them down. I couldn't keep a poster here. Every lead is turned over to police. We table talk a lot about you know what are some of the possibilities here and it's wide open at this point. So but Rob says that end. gap is that narrowing. Narrow now, there are extra hands on deck. I have to say, since uh, Ellen came on board, uh, Luke's uh, case has uh, is, uh, gone to the front lines again. The Ellen he's referring to is private investigator and podcaster Ellen White. Together, as a start, they've created an anonymous tip line and have rejigged the case's profile on social media. It's solvable. And I rarely, rarely make predictions about timelines, um, but I'm, I really feel confident that the information is in place now. It's going to lead to a resolution of a Luke Charlie de Roche case in months rather than years. Despite having over 30 years experience in cold case investigations, Ellen says it's hard to be unmoved by Rob's dedication. First parent we've ever taken out on ride alongs knocking on doors with me, going into crack houses with me, um, really being there doing everything that he can to get some information about his son, that commitment, that drive um, is really going to bring about the resolution for this case. Rob says he won't stop until he knows everything. I want to find him. He's, he's, he's my boy. He's, he's my only boy. And uh, I was proud of him back then like I would be today. And I just wonder, you know, where he'd be today and what he'd be doing. You know, he's somewhere near. I just feel that in my heart. Anyone with information about Luke Jolly de Rocher's disappearance can reach out confidentially through the family's tip line. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Kebawek, Quebec. An unidentified Cree woman found murdered in California over 40 years ago returns home to her family for burial. APTN's Chris Stewart talks to her niece, Violet, who never stopped searching for her aunt. In 1980, Shirley Suse's body was found in an almond orchard in California. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. With no identification, she was considered a Jane Doe and she was buried. Shirley was a traveler and from the Samsung Cree Nation in Alberta. She traveled to BC and lived there. She mentioned visiting a friend in Seattle. The last time the family heard from her was in 1979. Violet Suse traveled to BC for decades, looking in morgues and hostels to find her lost aunt. She had no success. 
Then, in 2020, Violet contacted an American nonprofit called the DNA Doe Project, who try to find missing Jane and John Doe's families. Since 2017, they have identified over 80 Jane and John Doe's. She saw a Facebook post from them saying that a Jane Doe from Kern County, California had been traced to the prairies by DNA. The DNA matched her Aunt Shirley. After 40 years, her aunt had been found. In 2012, Winston Charest was convicted of killing Shirley and another Jane Doe in California. Now Shirley's remains have been returned to her family in Samson Cree Nation, Alberta, for a wake and burial. Violet Suset says she was finally able to fulfill her promise to her grandmother to find Shirley. She spoke to the media outside a wake held in the nearby town of Wetaskiwin. Most of all today is relief that I'm able to uh, ensure that the promise I made to my grandmother, who is the matriarch on, on my father's side, that um, to find her and to bring her home, that is, this is the final step. Finding her was one, two years ago. Um, bringing her home is, is today. Today's that final step. She says she started the search as a young woman and has grown old looking. It's no more not knowing. It's no more uncertainties. We are certain she's home now and we are certain that we can visit her her gravesite even though we know spiritually she's already in, in in with creator and all our ancestors we know that the funeral for shirley was held on saturday violet says finding her lost aunt after 40 years means anything can happen we lose a lot of our young men our young women our girls our boys you know, adult men and women don't give up. Like, don't, don't give up because there is hope. If I can do it after 40 years, you know, with today's technology, uh, there's different mechanisms that can be utilized to, to find our loved ones. Uh, that's a message, like, don't give up. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Wetaskiwin, Alberta. We want to hear what you think about the stories you've seen so far tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. All right, we need to take a short break, but still to come. Concerns over wild salmon in BC as licenses come up for renewal. We're going to end up with no salmon. We're going to end up with no herring. No any kind of fish in the waters. It's going to become really big coast town in the waters.
Welcome back to APTN National News. Hereditary chiefs from three nations on Vancouver Island took to the waters. They are calling for the removal of fish farms in British Columbia and for federal government to not renew the existing licenses. Lee Wilson has that story for us. Hereditary Chief George Quaxeter Jr. of the Liquid Two Nation has been raising concerns for fish farms on Vancouver Island on the coast of BC for two decades. He says he's looked at 40 of the fish farms on BC's coast and says sea lice are devastating the migration routes of wild salmon. Sea lice are like bats. They need blood. So they go to those farms and they smell those uh, Atlantic salmon there that just keep pulling blood out of them. And they keep redu reproducing at those pens. So there's clouds of sea lice at the pens. And then when the baby fish go by that don't get, get into the pens, they get all sea lice up and killed off. BC salmon farms are a controversial issue because they have signed agreements with a few elected band councils, including Quaxeter Juniors, near Canberra River. But he says as a hereditary chief, he remains opposed. One month ago, Quaxeter Jr. held a rally where he says 97 nations came out against fish farms. This past weekend, along with hereditary chiefs from the Wiwakai and Comox nations, a rally was held to call for no more fish farms on the Discovery Islands. We went out there and made a noise, told them we do not want any farms restocked, period. We were very, very fortunate, Bernadette Jordan, a fisheries lady last year, she took these 19 out of my territory. And now these fellas were threatened to restock them, you know what I mean? Late in 2020, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Minister Bernadette Jordan ordered a phase out of fish farming, with nearly 20 to be shut down in June of 2022. Fish farm operators Maui Canada West, Surmac, and Craig Seafood applied for a judicial review. Then in April, a federal court judge ruled in favor of the fish farmers, saying DFO's order lacked fairness and she set aside the phase out. This June 29th, 79 fish farm licenses in BC are set to expire. The new DFO Minister Joyce Murray will need to make a decision to renew or not. We contacted DFO and the provincial governments for a statement. DFO did not respond before airtime. In an email statement to AP10 News, the BC Ministry of Land, Water and Resource Stewardship said, they understand the federal government is working to address open net salmon farming and they are calling for collaboration with stakeholders. We have brought together ministers from key portfolios to call upon the federal government to work collaboratively with First Nations and local governments and commit to a transition plan that supports families, coastal communities, and companies. Quack Sister has concerns about the future of wild salmon and BC's coast if fish farm licenses are renewed. We're going to end off with no salmon. We're going to end off with no herring. No, any kind of fish in the waters, it's going to become really big coast town in the waters. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. Affordable housing demands are skyrocketing in the Yukon, and the territorial government says they are working to find solutions for vulnerable Yukoners. But as Sarah Connors tells us, a new Auditor General's report says those efforts aren't measuring up. The Yukon government is not doing enough to supply housing for people in need. That's the findings of a new Auditor's General report on affordable housing and homelessness. The report says the Yukon government is not following through on housing commitments and there are problems managing existing stock and demand versus supply. Since 2014, the amount of social housing and rent supplement units grew by 20% but the demand for those units grew by 320% from 112 applicants to 463. And Kate Nietzsche is the executive director for the Safe at Home Society, an organization helping low-income and vulnerable Yukoners in need of housing. We simply do not have the housing stock to like, just meet the need, let alone adapt to an increase. She says a recent point in time count found 85% of people experiencing homelessness in Whitehorse were Indigenous and urgent community action is needed. Like we need to be addressing this as though people's lives depend on it because they actually do. The Yukon government has accepted all nine of the report's recommendations. Officials say departments managing housing have signed a memorandum of understanding to improve collaboration efforts. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse.
And still in the Yukon, a First Nation will get over $400,000 to research how climate change and permafrost thaw are affecting them. Northern Affairs Minister Dan Vandal made the announcement in the territory. Champagne and Ajax First Nations will research the effects of climate change, ranging from a loss of permafrost to other climate effects. Yukon University will partner with the nation, and Chief Steve Smith says the time is now to act on climate change. This research is going to help us um, to start to look ahead and, and use our own worldview on how to mitigate and prepare for some of the challenges that we know are going to come to us. All right, we need to step aside for one final break, but when we come back, we have some exciting news to share. Stick around. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This great photo was submitted by Vienna Francis. Vienna described this image as our amazing river of fire, AKA Alspatog First Nation, the two towers. If you look closely, you can see two separate water towers along the skyline. Keep those photos coming by emailing your pictures to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting over in the east, 18 in Rain in Fredericton and 10 in Charlottetown. Two degrees in Nain and six degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 29 and Sun in Val d'Or and 22 and Sun in Montreal. 31 in London and 33 in Sun in Windsor. 29 in a mix of Sun and Cloud in Timmins and 19 in Rain in Sioux Lookout. Rain in 3 degrees in Churchill, and 10 in rain in Norway House. 18 and some rain in Barron's River, and rain in 19 in Winnipeg. 16 in Estevan, and 18 in Saskatoon. 18 in Meadow Lake, and 16 in Uranium City. In the west, 19 in Fort McMurray, and 19 in Grand Prairie. 18 and some sun in Edmonton, and 17 and sun in Lethbridge. 
18 and some rain in Vancouver and 19 in Bella Coola. 14 in Prince Rupert and 24 in Fort Nelson. 23 and some sun in Whitehorse and 12 in Old Crow. Rain in 21 in Norman Wells and 24 in Fort Simpson. 10 degrees in Fort McPherson and 10 in Colville Lake. 3 degrees in Cambridge Bay and 2 degrees in Baker Lake. Minus 1 in Resolute and 4 in Clear in Iqaluit. We have some exciting news to share. APTN National News has won for Best Investigative Story of 2021 at the Canadian Association of Journalists Gala. The CAJ handed out awards over the weekend in Montreal. Reporters Brittany Guillot and Kathleen Martins took home the top prize for their work on day school deaths. Called Surviving Day Schools, the series uncovered 200 student deaths. The story won the Don McGilvery Award for Best Investigative Story of 2021, as well as the inaugural Freedom of Information Prize. Martins accepted the award. There are real people in these numbers in this data, so don't forget that. Just keep it simple. Share what it says and share, share it simply, share it respectfully. The other thing that I, I want to share with you is that parents Many of the parents don't know what happened to their children. Uh, they were the last to know. It was actually up to the Indian agent at the time who would decide whether to tell them or not. And a big congratulations to Kathleen and Brittany and the entire team. Everyone here at APTN News is absolutely thrilled. And I'd say that's a great way to end our show tonight. For more news, you can check out our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening.